Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 17353 in the name of Mark Ruskell on expanding Scotland's railways. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Mark Ruskell to open the debate. Mr Ruskell, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm delighted to lead this debate tonight and thank members from across the chamber for supporting the motion. Now, when I first stood for Holyrood, uh, all those years ago, back in 1999, I can remember fighting my way through the undergrowth at the abandoned rail station at Alloa, with a huge map of Mid-Scotland and Fife region displaying all the rail lines closed under the beaching era. It took a leap of imagination to believe that Stirling to Alloa line could reopen, but it did successfully in 2009, after strong leadership from Clap Manager Council and the vision of the community. Now, a decade on from that reopening, it's time to look again at the map and support communities who've been left to the mercy of deregulated bus companies and the inequality of private car ownership to meet their transport needs. We could be at the beginning of a new golden age for rail in Scotland, and I'm sure the minister will wish to talk about the longer, greener, faster trains that are bringing welcome improvements through electrification. But for communities in Fife who were rubbed off the rail map decades ago, these improvements won't deliver the transformational changes that they need to access work and educational opportunities. Now, after the opening of the fourth road bridge back in 1964, we had a string of rail closures that isolated communities and brought into sharp relief the transport inequalities of those who have no choice beyond public transport. Now the Queen's Free Crossing is open, it's important that new investment in rail can reach directly into those five communities who've been left behind. But sadly, there have been no rail reinstatement schemes commissioned since this current Holyrood government took charge over a decade ago. I hope this will, cha this will change and that through the new pipeline approach, we'll see robust business cases for stations and new lines brought forward, matched with the capital budgets that can prioritize low carbon rail. Now, my own team, this works with me, um, has brought together active rail campaigns from Kincardine to St Andrews, Newborough and Leavenmouth to share knowledge and support each other over the last couple of years. And this work resulted in a report that we published in 2017 examining how reinstated stations could feed into the Fife Circle rather than competing with each other. And what the communities told us was that they were stuck on first base and that the transport appraisal guidance process was very difficult to work through without professional support and that there were no dedicated funds to lever that kind of support in. In the case of Newborough, the community had even attempted to unsuccessfully squeeze money out of the National Lottery. So a dedicated stream of funding was needed to support communities to build the business cases for rail solutions and then test them to destruction. The idea of a local rail development fund was born out of these discussions, and I was very pleased that following last year's budget talks between the Greens and the SNP, £2 million was allocated, of which over £1 million is still left to be dispersed in the next round of funding, which closes at the end of June. Now, in my region, a number of projects were funded, including uh, Newborough Station campaign, which I've already mentioned, and Starlink, the St Andrews Rail campaign. Funding was also granted to TACTRAN, the Regional Transport Partnership, for two projects, one examining the possibility of putting in a station at Bridge of Erne, and also improving rail accessibility in Stirling, and then Fife Council was also successful in getting funding to complete a study into improving the cross-forth rail connections. Now, for Newborough, this funding has reignited the campaign in a community that watches trains pass through the heart of the village every hour, but has to travel 10 miles to their nearest station. It could reconnect the wider area around Newborough to employment and education opportunities in Fife and Perth. And in St Andrews, the campaign group, which has been working since 1989 to reconnect the town, can finally take its work to the next level, looking at how a branch line and station could alleviate congestion, tackle housing pressures, and provide a direct rail link to St Andrews' world-class university and international sporting events. The Levermouth Rail Campaign has also played a central role in supporting the wider development of the rail network in Fife, the interim stag for this area was published on the 17th of May, and although it includes a rail link as one of the six possible improvements, it still focuses very heavily on buses. Now, bus services have already been tweaked, but they haven't delivered the kind of transformational links that can come with a railway line 
nor the clean, fast connections to the cities that the local community so desperately desires. So we need to see progress at the next stage of that study urgently, and I would, I would welcome if the Minister could today confirm a timescale for the next stag stages and the subsequent grit reports for Leavenmouth Line, because the community is getting tired of waiting, and I'm sure a number of members who represent Fife will want to talk about that issue as part of this members' debate. Now, with the forthcoming strategic transport projects review, it is important that community voices around Scotland are heard. I've held workshops in Kincardine and Alloa in recent weeks, drawing in over 150 people, exploring local transport challenges, and how a rail reinstatement from Alloa to Dunfermline could provide a solution. And I've also been pleased that Talgo, the electric train manufacturer with advanced plans to establish a base in Longanit, have attended and supported both of these meetings. It's that kind of commitment that we'd hoped Diageo would have provided over 10 years ago to spur the development of the Levenmouth Railway, but so far it has failed to materialize. But the strong message from those meetings was that access to the east of Scotland is needed, that bus services are poor or non-existent, and that communities, especially Clackmannan, felt left behind when the Stirling Allo Kincardine line was open for freight. There were strong feelings of dislocation in the West Fife villages, and a concern that while Talgo's plans may open up an electrified line from Alloa to Longanet, there is an urgent need to consider the needs of West Fife villages at the outset. Presiding officer, we could be seeing a rail renaissance in Scotland, and just in time, as the climate emergency bites and the need for economic regeneration and a just transition is greater than ever. The Local Rail Development Fund has helped to spur the early thinking, but it is time now for the Scottish Government to respond and help get our communities back on the rail map. Thank you very much. Um, I have 10 members wishing to speak, so I'm afraid I have to be pretty strict, not like me as usual, uh, and keep me to four minute speeches, please. David Torrance will be followed by Jamie Green. Mr. Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank Mark Rusko for securing this important debate in Parliament today on expanding Scotland's railways. This morning, I travelled to Parliament by train. It took 45 minutes to reach Edinburgh from my constituency of Kirkcaldy, and during that time, I checked my emails, my social media, wished my constituents a happy birthday on Facebook, and chatted with other commuters. By taking this journey by rail, I was responsible for the emissions of 2.2 kilograms of CO2 into our atmosphere. If I had driven the same journey, I would have been responsible for four times that amount. The Scottish Government have set world-leading targets of achieving net zero emissions by 2045, that is to have the same volume of greenhouse gases that has been emitted as being absorbed through offsetting techniques such as forestry. There are a number of ways in which Scotland will achieve this, such as improving energy efficiency in homes, buildings and industrial processes, and championing the renewable energy potential by creating new jobs and supply chain opportunities, but also by encouraging individuals to adopt greener modes of transport, whether that be by switching to electric or hydrogen-powered vehicles or by better making use of public transport. However, individuals cannot make better use of public transport if it does not exist. As many may know, the mass closures of the train stations and removal of track infrastructure of the 60s, commonly known as the Beach of Max, led to a closure of 200 stations across Scotland and left some areas entirely isolated from the rail network. Regardless of whether it was the correct decision for preserving the rail network at the time, the closure had a prime effect on areas such as Leavenmouth, which is, sits in both mine and Jenny Gilruth's constituency. Leaving the mouth is one of the most deprived areas in Scotland. Its history and coal mining guaranteed high employment and relative prosperity in the area until it got declining in the 1970s. First they lost the railway, then they lost their industry. Now it is an area of multiple deprivation with 44% of Leaving Mouth residents living in one of the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland and one in four children living in poverty. The area also has low level of car ownership and many residents rely on public transport to do basic things like travel to work, do their shopping or attend medical appointments. Today, the Leave Mouth Rail campaign is fighting for a lost rail line to be acclaimed. The community run campaign, which was launched in 2014 and working tirelessly to keep the case of a railway, area's railway reinstatement on the front burner. We believe strongly that isolation from the rail network is holding back the area back by limiting employment and education opportunities for locals, which is costing the local economy greatly. Their most recent breakthrough was the commissioning of a second stag feasibility study with Transport Scotland that was released earlier this month. It states that reopening the existing line to passengers and freight would provide direct and quicker access to a range of opportunities and services, such as education, culture, leisure, health and employment. 
and it can prove a potential for business to locate to the area and for these businesses, as well as current employers, to attract people with the necessary job skills and experience to work in the area. Not only is reopening the line beneficial to the area, but the overwhelming success of the reopening of the border railway only strengthens the case for reopening of the Leave Mouth line. Since its opening, the line has opened up employment opportunities, reduced congestion, increased tourism, and increased re relocation to the area. I believe that if given the same opportunity, all these benefits could be replicated in the Leave Mouth area with a reinstatement of the rail line. In conclusion, President Officer, the benefits of expanding our rail network are more aptly reinstating pre-existing lines and are outstandingly clear. As Scotland works to achieve a net zero carbon emissions by 2045, we must put in place the infrastructure to help our citizens do their part. More railways means more passengers and rail freight, which means less vehicles on our roads, creating less emissions and causing less congestion. But a railway line is not more than a mode of transport. It's a lifeline that connects communities, creates economic opportunities and expands the horizons of those it serves. It can be a difference between someone taking a job or not, starting a business or not, visiting an attraction or not. In order for them to say yes, we must say yes to creating a public transport network this country could be proud of. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Green, who will be followed by Julian Martin. Mr Green, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, add my thoughts to that last speech? I thought it was an excellent summary of why rail is so important. It's good to hear words like uh, rail renaissance happening in Scotland, but I would like in my short few minutes to address some of the issues that it faces. Uh, we know that uh, domestic transportation accounts for 32% of our emissions, and that excludes aviation. So getting more people onto our trains is absolutely key uh, to meeting our uh, climate change ambitions. And I'm sure members today will have a, a long list of stations and lines they wish to reopen, open, or indeed build from new. And I look forward to hearing some of those suggestions. But as Mark Ruskell pointed out, uh, making a business case for these projects is difficult, it's complex, and can even be expensive. Uh, taking people who are real enthusiasts and local campaigners up a level to uh, robust business cases for large-scale infrastructure, infrastructure projects is no mean feat. Many local authorities are doing so, East Lothian, Fife, South Lanarkshire, using that money uh, to carry out appraisals, stag reviews and assess their transport needs, and I hope that these will uh, lead on to uh, improvements in infrastructure. And yes, we'll no doubt hear that we are moving away from old diesel trains and uh, new electric uh, trains, new carriages, new lines, and I think good progress has been made in that. It's very welcome pro uh, progress. But electrification is an expensive game to play in. I think technology might play a huge part in addressing some of these problems. For example, how do we use electric trains on non-electric lines, for example? I've met with stakeholders who sing high praises of the use of battery technology, which bolts on the underneath of carriages and allows trains to go off-grid and reach those last few vital miles of a journey on a non-electrified line. It's not the great panacea to the problem, but I'd be keen to hear from the Minister uh, what conversations the government are having with manufacturers of this type of technology. Like many uh, MSPs, uh, we've identified that uh, connecting rural Scotland is so important to our growth. Research shows that the impact of a rail station in a rural area has uh, uh, exponentially uh, higher average growth in those areas uh, than building stations in urban areas. So there is a clear link, but the future won't be easy for us either. Uh, the motion talks about the Donovan re uh, report. And I think, yes, it's a good, it's a comprehensive list of recommendations that ScotRail should take on board. But they are, in my view, the low-hanging fruit and rather short-term fixes. It's actually quite a depressing read. It's a depressing wish list of failures uh, on the part of our operator. Progress has been made, but ScotRail themselves admit that it's reaching all of its uh, performance targets is nigh on impossible within the lifetime of the current franchise. Like many in the industry, I too am uh, awaiting the Williams Review, which I thought deserves mention today. And this is really setting the scene for wider structural changes to how UK Rail will operate. Yes, that could include potential structural changes to network rail, and indeed the very essence of the franchise model itself, which let's face it, is not serving everyone perfectly. Uh, in closing, can I uh, quote Keith Williams uh, himself, who's performing this review? I think it sums up the complexity of the task we face. He says, there needs to be much more focus on passengers. Passengers must be at the heart of the future of the railway. And it's not just the passenger of today, but the passengers of tomorrow, who will look at rail differently 
than we do today. And hopefully, if we do our job right, as part of a more integrated transport network. The expansion of our railways will take many years, indeed decades, new trains, new stations, and new lines, and that's on top of maintaining our existing infrastructure. Rail is expensive and requires huge long-term commitment. It's a noble ambition, but ambition alone builds not a mile of track or a brick of a station. The old adage rings truer than ever today, money makes the wheels go round. Thank you very much. I now call Julian Martin to be followed by Colin Smith. Ms Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. There is only one railway station in my constituency. It's in Inverurie, which is just on the edge of my constituency. There's no other rail infrastructure across the whole of my constituency. And then as you go up to Stuart Stevenson's constituency of Banff and Buchan, he can't even boast a railway station at all or one bit of railway track. So the people in the, the northeast of the northeast are really uh, left behind when it comes to uh, public transport options. We have got our bus service, which is a very radial bus service, all feeding into Aberdeen City. Um, but what that means for the people of my constituency and Stuart Stevenson's is that we are largely reliant on our cars. Now, it will not have escaped the, the notice of anyone in this chamber that we now have a climate emergency. And I feel really that um, living in the, the, the part of the North East that I do, that I'm very limited in how I can play my part in addressing um, the reduction of carbon emissions. Um, we, of course, are looking at a, a increased infrastructure for, for electrification of cars and the charging points around that. But we also have um, a large part of our population for whom owning a car, particularly a new car, will be for all, forever out of their reach. So they are consigned to using a bus service, which I don't think is particularly fit for, pur for purpose. Um, I guess I'm going to use my time and thank Mark Rusko for giving me the opportunity by bringing this debate to the Chamber today because I guess I'm going to use my time really to um, ask the government to consider to almost ignore the surveys that have been done uh, around rail in the North East which um, although they rightly look at improving the existing infrastructure and making journeys faster they always never seem to be able to make the business case for reopening the Fermartin Buchan line even as far as just Ellen. I mean, obviously, um, it would be better for it to go as far as Peterhead, but I realise that maybe that needs to be an incremental step in just bringing it to Ellen. Ellen has... Yes, I will. John Finney. Thank you, President. I'm very grateful for the member taking an intervention at that point. The, the government undertook to review all its policies as a result of declaring a climate emergency. Would one such review, in the member's opinion, be the benefit of revisiting spending three billion and dueling the A96? Gillian Martin. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting point that, that John Finney makes because obviously um, we, we've got in a situation where we're looking at the various routes that go round Inverurie for the duelling of the A96. And it's something which my constituencies are exercised about in, in a very serious way. Um, that was a manifesto commitment, but of course, as the First Minister says, she's looking at all policy areas to look at how we can look at um, reducing our carbon emissions. And I would imagine that nothing's off the table there. I'm not going to nail my colours to the mast about what I think she should do in that particular regard. But I would, I would make the point that as we look at what we do with our transport infrastructure in the future, that rail has to be part of that. And it's not just a case of improving the rail infrastructure as it stands across the whole of Scotland, but looking to areas that are completely and utterly left behind and don't have the option of using rail at all. I want to, before I sit down, I just want to, to make one uh, further point. We've got 11,000 people in, in Ellen, and 31% of them work in Aberdeen City. Um, some of them, those, uh, those, pe those people um, will opt to always use their cars. But I really, really think that if we look again at seriously um, reaching out to the people in the North East that don't have the option of rail and ask them, as we've done before, would you use the train? I think that the higher proportion of people would actually say yes to using that. I've actually published a survey, I'm publishing it tomorrow, which is actually asking those questions of the people all along the proposed route for the for Martin Bucket Way, just to see how many people would use it. And I'm hoping to take that to the government and to get more evidence that the people of Aberdeenshire would really relish the opportunity of taking the train rather than their cars. 
Thank you very much. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Ross Greer. Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interest where it states I'm the, the, the volunteer chair of the campaign for the reopening of East Riggs Railway Station. Can I also thank Matt Ruskell for tabling his motion, allowing tonight's debate on rail a subject I don't think this Parliament discusses often enough. The day to day issues around rail performance are often highlighted during questions, not least because that performance is just not good enough. But our long term vision for rail, how we grow rail, how we meet demand for rail is rarely, if ever, debated in this chamber and certainly not in government time. That's despite the, the real need to increase the pace of growth. The motion highlights the, the role of the, the local rail development fund in helping achieve that growth. It's a fund I support, uh, although it may be a bit premature to describe it as a success, yet with just £700,000 of the £2 million so far allocated and the fact it's part of a new, as yet untested, pipeline process. The real test will be whether that fund and the new process, which I support in principle, is enough to tackle the current underinvestment in our rail infrastructure and crucially ensure that this investment is inclusive of all of Scotland. Because if the government is serious about delivering inclusive economic growth, they need to ensure there is an equitable share of infrastructure investment. It needs to recognise that making a case for investment through the, the STAG process is still hugely challenging for rural areas such as my own South Scotland region, given our often low population catchment. But that doesn't mean there isn't a need for new investment within the rail work in South West Scotland. The current Glasgow South West line, which runs between Glasgow and Kilmarnock before branching off in two directions, from Ra to the west uh, and towards Glas uh, Carlisle in the east, has lacked investment in the past. This was exposed when the West Coast main line was closed due to storm damage and this valley line was used as a diversion. Trains that normally travel at over 100 miles per hour in the West Coast main line crawled their way along that diversion route. There's a real need to upgrade that line from a rural to a main line. That includes electrification, not just from Glasgow to Kilmarnock, but the full length of the line. There's also strong cases for new stations along the way. Reopening East Riggs Station would give the growing number of people in that area who travel to, to work in Annan, Dumfries and Carlisle, eh, also for education and healthcare, a real positive public transport alternative to the car. The 28 mile stretch between Dumfries and Sankar is the longest part of the line with no station, highlighting the need to reopen Thornhill Station, improving links between Mid Nisdale to both Dumfries and beyond, uh, as well as to the Central Belt. In Ayrshire, communities in Cumnock and Mocklin are making the powerful case I fully support for the reopening of local stations there, which experts show could attract hundreds of thousands of passengers a year, boosting the economies and communities with some of the highest levels of unemployment in Scotland. There's also smaller improvements that can be made. It remains a scandal that there's no disabled access on the southbound platform two at Kirkconnell Station. In the west of the region, the, the poor infrastructure linking the ferry port at Cairn Ryan and town of Stranra with the rest of Scotland and the UK is an issue that's also well documented. Yet the current railway station in Stranra sits some distance from the town centre on the pier of the now closed Stranra ferry terminal. Exploring the relocation of that station, possibly into the town centre as part of a wider transport hub, is entirely the type of project I hope will secure funding from local, the local rail development fund. There's also a campaign to reopen Beatick Railway Station on the West Coast mainline, highlighting the demand for commuter services to Carlisle and Glasgow and Edinburgh from the area. And there are plenty of passenger trains that already travel along the West Coast mainline. It's just that more actually pass through the local station at Lockerbie than actually stop at the station. President officer, in concluding, I highlight some of these as just some examples from my own South Scotland region where investment in the rail network would make a huge difference to communities, to the economy and to our environment. I hope that ultimately these projects and others will receive government support in the years ahead so that we do have a genuinely inclusive rail network that covers all of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Ross Greer to be followed by Mark McDonald. Mr Greer, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Mark Rusko for giving those of us who spend a comical amount of time uh, dealing with the rail lines in our region a chance to either celebrate recent progress or use this as a form of group therapy for where progress isn't happening. Uh, improving our rail network, both passenger and freight, is key to tackling the climate emergency, but it's also key to tackling issues of public health, such as air pollution and road safety. And to the social justice agenda, which says that your ability to travel, to reach the wider community, to access services, shouldn't depend on your ability to run a car. And this is certainly an issue across the west of Scotland. The minister might be familiar with my campaign to reduel the Westerton to Mogai line. That line was twin tracked until 1990. It's been a single track ever since. And it's now the only single track terminating line in the country to run four trains an hour. 
The lines at maximum capacity, even slight delays, can't be made up for. This is translated into the Mogai line consistently performing the worst of any in Scotland. In 2018, just one in four trains ran on time. The latest figures for this month show it's essentially the same at 28%. Now, positive changes have happened. Trains arriving in Mogai no longer head straight back out, making use of the second platform for turnover time. And the extension of platform one at Westerton Station means that a train sitting at that platform no longer blocks the junction, preventing other trains from moving on or off the Mogai line. But these improvements haven't translated into a transformed performance. We're still sitting at about one in four trains on time. I don't advocate redoing that line because it's the only thing we could think of. I commissioned rail expert and former network rail officer David Prescott to conduct a technical study of the line, and this was his conclusion. The Mogai line is almost unique in actually seeing passenger numbers fall whilst usage of the whole network grows. It's simply so unreliable that local residents are giving up, but they're not getting the bus. We're actually dealing with cuts to local bus services as well, including the City Bus 15 from Mogai into Glasgow City Centre. One effect is those who can afford to are getting into their cars again, which is a knock-on effect of its own. Drummond Road in Bears Den has an acute air pollution issue. It's a designated air quality management area with a primary school playground at its centre. Our chronically unreliable rail service and cuts to local bus services are making that air pollution worse, pollution that affects the oldest and the youngest in our community the most. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary has met with me to discuss this. He received the report that I commissioned. And I recognise that the Donovan Review identified the Mogai line as needing specific improvements. But I'm utterly unconvinced that anything short of redueling will have the desired effect. A second track there would also allow for the construction of the long-mooted Allender station, something that we need now more than ever as another housing development in the area has just been completed. Delays in Mogai affect the whole network, though, across West and Central Scotland, indeed as far as here in Edinburgh. But they have a particular effect on the lines to Dalmuir, Dumbarton, Balloch and Helensborough. Only 43% of trains through Dalmuir are running on time. And of the trains that terminate at Dalmuir, that number drops to 29%, almost as bad as Mogai. Moving further south, neither Paisley Canal or Largs are mentioned in the remedial plan or in Donovan, but both have similarly poor performance stats to Mogai. Largs has improved by almost 10%, but it's still sitting under 40%. But Paisley Canal has gone in the opposite direction, with performance dropping 10% in the last two years to less than one in three trains on time. Largs has a second track as far as Hunterston, which was used only for freight. It's not electrified and it's not used now. Uh, and given our Dross and Harbour's performance is now worse than Largs, the issues are likely occurring further up the line anyway. But I would suggest a study into local improvements there would be a strong candidate for the next round of LRDF funding. Paisley Canal, uh, Paisley Canal is a little bit more complicated, but given its steep decline there, something clearly needs to be done. If the Minister doesn't have the specific details to hand to address the issues on these lines, I'd appreciate if he or the Cabinet Secretary could write with some further information on what's currently planned or what's being considered. And I, absolutely. There isn't time. Sorry, there isn't Sorry. time. Uh, I'll, I'll look forward to hearing from the Minister and his, his closing remarks. Uh, I realise this sounds like a shopping list, because it is. My constituents have some of the worst rail lines in the country. Usage is falling when it should be doing the opposite, and we're in the midst of a climate emergency. This is exactly the kind of ambitious capital project required to tackle that emergency head-on and give Scotland the world-class public transport network that we deserve. Thank you very much, and I thank members so far. Keeping to their time, it's excellent. Let's continue it. Mark McDonnell, followed by Emma Harper. Mr McDonnell, please. Thank you very much, presiding Officer. Message received and understood. Um, I congratulate Mark Ruskell on uh, securing this important debate and, and bringing this issue to the Chamber. Um, he rightly mentioned at the very beginning of his speech the shadow of the beaching report which hangs over much of the rail infrastructure or lack of rail infrastructure in parts of Scotland, um, not just in rural areas but also in many urban communities which lost uh, rail stations during the beaching era. Um, I, uh, in my own constituency, have the rail station of Dice, which is one of the busiest small stations in Scotland, yet was one of the stations which was closed as a result uh, of the beaching report and wasn't reopened again until 1984. Um, my uh, office manager who lives in Lymphannon did ask me if I would uh, also mention the loss of the D-side line. I said there might be a local member who would already, who'd be willing to mention that, but I don't see any of the local members uh, in the chamber, so I, I will put on the record as well the, the loss of the D-side line in the northeast as well. Uh, Gillian Martin mentioned the Formartin-Buchan line, which she and I have uh, in the past spoken about and agreed on 
the need for uh, proper uh, appraisal and investment to look at bringing that back into use. Uh, I've looked at the uh, most recent appraisal report and it is true to say that if one were to simply look at this as a cold cost benefit calculation, it doesn't necessarily make sense uh, on paper for the route to be reopened. But I believe that there are uh, wider considerations and indeed in transport appraisal terms, there is a positive case made within the report for the route to be brought back uh, into use. Um, I believe that as part of a wider rail strategy for the North East, it would have an integral part to play. Um, there are obviously technical considerations, although the report does conclude that it is technically feasible for the route to be brought back into use and it would connect through my, uh, into my constituency uh, through Dice Station and on to Aberdeen were it to simply follow the previous route uh, as used. Uh, briefly, of course. Julian Martin. Would the member agree with me that any proposed rail line should also have a station at Newmarket so that other people in the surrounding area, perhaps coming off the A947, might be able to park and ride? Mark McDonald. Indeed, and I believe that the uh, option, the three options assessed all included the option of a station at Newmarket. And I think given uh, the point I was going to make, which I'll make just shortly around urban expansion, the expansion that is taking place in Newmarket and other areas of the A947 corridor, that would be a sensible step to make. And I'm sure the member didn't have an, an interest as a resident of Newmarket in, in, in raising that in particular uh, in terms of a station in Newmarket. But uh, uh, one of the things I would uh, also want to highlight is around the need to look at urban uh, stations, presiding officer. Um, looking in my constituency, communities such as Bucksburn or Woodside could benefit from an urban station. Uh, if we look at the development patterns that are likely to take place within the city of Aberdeen, Bucksburn in particular is likely to see a significant expansion, both in terms of housing, but also with the recent, uh, with the soon to be completed exhibition and conference centre uh, and hotel infrastructure that will take place around that. The opportunity for an urban station perhaps in the Stonywood, Bucksburn or Woodside area could have a significant effect in reducing congestion. We've already seen the AWPR take a significant amount of congestion away from the Hadigan roundabout and routes into the city. An opportunity to in increase uh, urban rail uh, through the dueling of the line which has taken place and also the provision of new urban stations may add to that. One final issue which I think needs to be highlighted is the question that continues to be asked, particularly by Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, around how exactly the £200 million that is identified within the city region deal for the North East will be spent to reduce uh, rail journey times and improve infrastructure. There are concerns that that money may not be spent within the North East area and that that may not be entirely in keeping with the letter of what was agreed at the time that the city region deal was signed. I'd be more than happy to meet the Minister to discuss this further. As I say, it's an issue that the Chamber of Commerce have raised with myself and other local members on a repeated basis. And I'll, I'll stop there, presiding Officer, in order to avoid incurring your wrath. Thank you very much. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to be able to speak in this important debate and I thank Mark Ruskell for securing it. I'd like to focus my contribution on the absolute need for greater investment on the rail network across the southwest of Scotland, which many constituents have contacted me about. Scotland's railway network is vitally important in allowing people the freedom to travel accessibly and with ease around our country. And the railway does not discriminate on the basis of disability, although I do acknowledge that there are access issues at Kirkconnell. The rail travel does not require people to have a driver's licence. It reduces emissions, as David Torrance has rightly highlighted, and rail promotes active travel by allowing those with bicycles who choose cycling holidays, for example, to get to a, from A to B hassle-free. Presiding officer, the Galloway and West Dumfries area of my South Scotland region has three key train routes. The Stranraer to Glasgow route, the Dumfries to Carlisle route and the Dumfries to Glasgow route. All of these routes are well used and relied on by many people living and working as well as travelling to and from the area every day for work, leisure and study. However, all too often many constituents are telling me that they are put off using these routes because the trains are too irregular, too outdated and the journey time too lengthy. Attracting people to live, work, study and visit rural areas such as Dumfries and Galloway is crucial if we are to keep these areas populated and for them to flourish. Good transport links and connectivity are essential. And over recent years, we have seen a steady decline of the working age population across Dumfries and Galloway, with young people leaving the region for employment and education. This has left the area with a skill shortage and recruitment 
problems, particularly when it comes to jobs in healthcare and the recruitment of GPs, radiologists and other healthcare professionals. Indeed, when meeting with local businesses, GP practices and NHS in Fries and Galloway to discuss how we can attract people to live and work in the region, the railway network, or lack of it, is often described as a top priority on local folks' wish lists. And recently, when meeting a local GP practice in Dumfries, the GPs told me that they are aware of colleagues who live in the Central Belt who would be more than happy to work in Dumfries, as well as across Bonnie Galloway, but are put off because of the current state of the rail services and underdeveloped road network. The GPs and staff told me that if the journey time, for example, between Dumfries and Galloway, which is currently almost an hour and 50 minutes, could be reduced by faster trains, then more highly skilled professionals such as GPs would come and work in our region, which would, of course, be welcome. The same is true for Stranraer, and I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to explore options for the electrification of these rail routes to speed up travel time. I, would all, I have also written to Network Rail to ask what support they are providing to the Scottish Government to assist with the needed upgrades as the lines are owned by Network Rail. Presiding officer, I have been contacted by local action groups with regards to the possible reopening of the Dumfries to Stranraer line and other groups are lobbying for the opening of Beatick station and even moving Stranraer station to be closer to the Toon Centre. Since the volume of traffic has increased on the A75 for the ferries from Cairn Ryan, it has caused much concern and people have justified frustration over the fact that the road is so busy now. So in conclusion, presiding officer, the possible reopening of the east-west line would allow those without cars to accessibly travel across the region. And I would like to stress to the people of the south of Scotland who often say they feel forgotten that I am not forgetting about them and I will continue to lobby for our region's transport infrastructure to be improved in this parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Harper. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Ms Hamilton, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, I want to thank Mark Ruskell for bringing such an important and topical debate to the Chamber today. And it is refreshing to be speaking about new railways, given the immense opportunities they can bring to connect communities, as the motion says, particularly to rural Scotland and the likes of my constituency in Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire. Whilst today's debate doesn't focus on the efficiency and service on our railways, I just want to make it clear from the outset, if we are to build confidence and to improve customer satisfaction on Scotland's railways, we need to see ScotRail clean up its act. It's fine and well having brand new railways like the Borders Railway, but if the trains don't arrive on time or even at all, we will not see the benefits in order to tackle climate change or unlock business growth. This is a very timely debate because yesterday uh, Murdo Fraser lookalike, Michael Portillo, travelled on the Borders Railway uh, for his BBC Two documentary series, Great British Railway Journeys. And the Borders Railway, which serves many of my constituents, albeit outside of my constituency, is a fantastic example of where a rural region was opened up to the Central Belt and beyond. The railway is the longest domestic railway to be built in the UK for over 100 years. The Waverley, Waverley Line also, um, as it is known, takes passengers through some of the most beautiful countryside in the borders. In fact, going through the presiding officer's own constituency too. The original Edinburgh to Hoyk Line opened in 1849 with the extension to Carlisle in 1862. It's known as the Waverley Route after the first published novel of celebrated Scottish Borders resident Sir Walter Scott. It provided direct rail services between Edinburgh and the Scottish Borders Yorkshire and onwards towards London for 107 years. And ahead of the 2016 Scottish Parliament elections, the First Minister promised a feasibility study to extend this railway. And I'm glad that the UK government has announced it would back a full feasibility study to extend the Borders Railway from Hoyk through down to Newcastleton and on to Carlisle as part of the 345 uh, million Borderlands growth deal. And all this, of course, wouldn't have been possible without the campaign for Borders Rail, who have been determined and hardworking from the start. Yes, quickly. There's a member of Colin, Co Thank you. I'd like, I'd, I like to keep a little, my job going. Colin Smith. 
just trying to avoid using too much time, but would the member uh, agree that it's important to keep an open mind as to where any particular extension of the Borders rail line should go? And, for example, a route through the town of Langham would certainly be a boost to the economy in that area. You'll get your time back, Ms Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, um, Colin Smith, of course, would be championing uh, going through Langham, Langham, but I'm championing going through Newcastleton, and I will be uh, uh, supporting the campaign for Borders Rail in order to do that. Um, but we're so pleased that this um, manifesto commitment has been delivered, and it will bring transformational change um, to a region that has significant challenges um, and mass, but massive potential with 14 million people living within two hours drive of that borderlands region. But in order to tap into this, we do need more cross-border connectivity and collaboration. Uh, the deal is jointly financed between the UK and Scottish Government and the progress of study is now dependent on the Scottish Ministers agreeing to give permission to proceed. And I would like the Minister to um, give us an update if he possibly can in his closing. Um, Away from the Borders Railway in Berwickshire, I'm also glad the Scottish Government have committed to the reinstatement of Reston Station following the successful campaign by Rages, because Berwickshire at some points in time does feel left out. Um, and I look forward to that uh, happening within CP6 between um, 2019, which is now, and 2024. Um, and again, it's been through hard work by local authorities. But that will then... Uh, go down through the East Coast Main Line and crucial to connect the borders through to Newcastle, to, uh, sorry, Newcastle, York and London. In conclusion, presiding officer, we know that new railways are important um, for our future. The borders hasn't yet um, been a recipient from the local rail development fund, but perhaps it, it could do to create uh, further connectivity within um, that such a rural area. Um, but I'll, I shall leave it there because I can see time's running short. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I call the next member, I say due to the number of members who wish to speak in this debate, I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. I invite Mark Ruskell to move a motion without notice. Formally moved. Thank you very much. Are we all agreed? I now call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you to Mark Ruskell uh, for bringing this motion about a future rail revolution to debate tonight. Can I refer uh, members to my uh, uh, register of interest, the membership of the Campaign for Borders Rail? Expanding Scotland's railways is indeed a vital step that needs to be taken. Passengers' use of trains has effectively doubled in the last 20 years. People want to use trains. There are many Scottish communities trying to get their train services back, but they are continually being thwarted uh, in part by this admin administration and, the, and in part by the challenging and expensive processes involved. I recently attended a stag appraisal consultation meeting about the reopening of Beatuk station in my South Scotland region. There was so much determination and vision by the local rail action group in relation to the opportunities and the carbon reduction contributions this could make from tourism to commuting. There was a presentation from Moffat High School students who put into stark relief the challenges of not having a nearby station. Students could travel daily if, if the station was reopened to Glasgow or Edinburgh or Carlisle for college or university. They could also go clubbing, as they stressed, and get home. I hope optimism about, re uh, uh, about remaining in their own communities uh, will not be crushed by a negative result of this stag uh, report. Constituents have stressed to me from that area and other places in South Scotland their view that the stag process is ineffective in facilitating the reopening of lines and stations and local authorities are being forced to often waste scarce funding on repeated stag applications. Now Scottish Government has declared a climate emergency and rightly so. However, without robust actions on rail, it rings somewhat hollow despite other actions. We know the main source of climate change emissions in Scotland is from transport, and in particular the ever-expanding amount of road traffic. The answer is clear, and part of that answer, which I will focus on today, is give communities their rail services back. There are even examples, such as at Leavenmouth, where the tracks still exist, but the lines remain closed. The big rail reopenings initiated under previous administrations, Lark Hall, Alloa, um, Airdrie Bathgate and Borders Rail, have been hugely successful, beyond all projections. 
But never again must we fail to future-proof new lines such as happened in the Borders Railway. Scottish, Rail Scot uh, Scottish Labour rather, is fully supportive of the extension to Carlisle of the Borders Railway. The Scottish Government should continue the process of reopening our rail networks, lines and stations. It is scandalous that millions of pounds of taxpayers' money subsidises private companies while they cherry-pick profits and cut lines and services, uh, le leaving communities isolated and alienated. Scotland needs an integrated, publicly owned and therefore properly accountable rail network where trains run on time and aren't cancelled. And it also needs a properly regulated bus service, which we will be looking at through the Transport Bill. We need a network where you can get a bus from a rural village that connects with a train to take you onward. Carstairs is an example of a now vibrant station, though it still needs more stops and a Sunday service. However, the lack of bus connections is an embarrassment. We also need a network where you can travel between towns and villages with ease for work, family and leisure, and a network where disabled access at our stations is a priority and not a vain hope. And finally, we need a network where there is space and time for rail freight, a network where the profits of the busy routes no longer line the purses of absentee shareholders and foreign governments, but are used to fund the less profitable but equally important rural routes. I look forward to hearing the Minister's response on how we can have a rail service for the future uh, uh, fit for purpose for Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Jenny Gilruth, please. Thank you. And can I start by congratulating Mark Ruskell on bringing forward uh, this evening's debate. Presiding officer, um, it will come as no surprise to members that I wish to contribute in tonight's debate to highlight the best and the most obvious opportunity to expand Scotland's railways, and that is to re-establish Leavens Railway. The line first opened on the 3rd of July 1854, exactly 165 years ago this summer. And whilst passenger services stopped in 1969, the line remained open for freight right up until 2001. Today, with the permission of Network Rail, it is still possible to walk the line. And my colleague David Torrance and I did that just weeks ago. And we were joined by Claire Baker, MSP, and by local councillors Ken Caldwell and Alistair Sutty. The walk was organised by the fantastic Leave Mouth Rail campaign and last year the focus of the walk was the Year of Young People. This year the walk included different primary schools and facts about the history of the railway. Leaving Railway is the only proposed new line that I know of which has been through two formal SAG appraisals in 2008 and 2015 respectively and following my members debate in 2017 the then Cabinet Secretary committed, sorry Transport Secretary committed to a further options appraisal, uh, the limited options of which published two weeks ago with the final report to publish by the end of this week. And in the preliminary options appraisal Transport Scotland said the project would bring major benefits to the economy and provide access to key destinations for employment further education, healthcare and social activities. This is hugely important for the Fife economy. We've just had a debate this afternoon about the future sustainability of jobs in methyl. The coal industry, which dominated much of the Fife skyline for generations, is long gone. The need for a joined up approach to the transport system has arguably never been greater. Leavenmouth is the largest urban area in the country with no direct access to rail. Think about that. If you don't know Fife, please look at a map. Leavenmouth is isolated and cut off from much of the investment and wealth which uh, drives this capital city, but it needn't be the case. Up the road from Leaven is St Andrews, a town brimming with investment. From the university to golf, St Andrews has considerable wealth compared to parts of my constituency. I note that today's motion makes explicit mention of St Andrews' proposals for a railway, and I would also offer my support to them on that journey. But... Uh, the journey for Leavenmouth for me is far more compelling because a real link for Leaven could transform that part of Fife. It could transform the life chances of the young people growing up there. It could bring investment. It could open the doors for employers. Yes, I will. Mark Ruskell. Thank the member for giving way. As, an, a regional, as a regional MSP, I obviously support many of these rail reopening campaigns. But is this not a question about phasing, that, that Leavenmouth is, is pretty much ready to go that it could be brought forward perhaps in the, in the control period that we're now looking at, whereas St Andrews may come at a later control period, uh, later investment. 
because it's a much bigger project that would need to be undertaken. Jenny Gilruth. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, yes, I would agree with that point from, from Mark Ruskell. Um, his motion also today makes a specific mention about the Local Rail Development Fund, which was made available by the Scottish Government and certainly very welcome. I was, however, disappointed that the Leave Mouth Rail campaign weren't able to benefit from that fund because they were advised that their project was too far on. I do understand, though, that other campaigns are at different stages, as we've just uh, heard, but I don't want my constituency to miss out on that vital funding, and I'd be grateful, perhaps, if the Minister could mention um, how that could be avoided in his summing up later. Fife is the third most populous council area after Glasgow and Edinburgh, but unlike the cities, its population is geographically spread, and many Fifers have to commute for work. In my constituency, we continue to face the very real problems associated with austerity, with one in three children living in poverty. There is a need for a hope, uh, hope in the area uh, and for an area which has been cut off from transport links for so long. This has only become exacerbated since Stagecoach decided to cut the direct leave into Glasgow bus service with absolutely no consultation with MSPs. In 2016, the population of Leavenmouth was just over 35,000, the fourth largest settlement in Fife and the 25th largest in Scotland. There's lower than average car ownership, as we've heard from David Torrance, which again makes the case for public transport all the more stronger. Time is short today, but I do want to commend the efforts of the local Leavenmouth Rail campaign for all their consistent work to ensure the line's reinstatement is never off the local political agenda. And I see that my time is just slightly over there, presiding officer, so with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I thank all members for keeping to their time. I now call on Paul Wheelhouse to close for the government. Minister, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And first of all, could I also add my thanks to Mark Ruskell for raising the motion that informed today's discussion and importantly shining a light on our rail industry and its significance to our economy, our communities and our climate. And indeed, uh, David Torrance, I think, at the early part of the debate gave some very good examples of how local rail projects can help support the local economy. I know that was uh, supported by Jamie Green and others in terms of his, his contribution. Um, rail contributes around 1.3 billion to Scotland's economy annually, and this is why we've invested uh, an unprecedented eight billion pounds plus in rail across Scotland since 2007. I do acknowledge, as uh, members have mentioned today, there are still challenges, and I don't want to uh, spend time today talking about that when uh, we're clearly there's a focus on many local projects that I want to try and respond to if I can. Um, but the investment has resulted in the building of Scotland's longest domestic railway in 100 years, the Borders Railway, one that I know is very close to the heart of the presiding officer today uh, in terms of the work that she did in bringing that to being. So uh, I know that's something that's uh, of particular interest to her, adding 76 kilometres of new track, um, five uh, direct routes between our two main cities with 13 trains per hour in each direction and 14 new stations opened since 2007, many of which have been, as members have alluded to, highly successful. And I think, speaking to officials before the debate, I think Lawrence Kirk has been singled out as a particular success in terms of uh, exceeding the expectations that were, that, were, that were had for that particular station. But unlike other parts of the UK, and despite the financial pressures imposed on us by UK government, we have not canceled or deferred any rail projects. And there could be no uh, clearer signal to our communities, passengers, freight customers indeed as well, the rail industry or its supply chain of the confidence we have as a government in the future of rail and the importance of its expansion and improvement uh, to the people and communities of Scotland as well as the decarbonisation of Scotland's transport sector which uh, the point Gillian Martin raised uh, if I can I'll briefly bring in Mr Ruskell. Mark Ruskell. I thank the, the Minister for giving way and, and acknowledge uh, the success of those projects that have been constructed during the lifetime of this government but does he share my concern that none have been commissioned during the lifetime of this government and that we need to now accelerate the pipeline of projects, otherwise we're going to run out of projects to build. Minister? I, I certainly stand to be corrected, but I do not believe that assessment is correct. Obviously, I know there's uh, work ongoing in Royal Royston and other uh, locations across the country, but I, I, I'm not the lead minister in this portfolio, as the member will appreciate, but certainly I uh, will check that fact. But uh, certainly we have a number of projects which are coming through in CP6, and I can, I'm just about to turn to them in terms of the projects we are committed to doing in CP6. Uh, and indeed uh, a number of investments have been made through CP5 as well. In fact, just to deal with that while well, I can, um, the ring fence, uh, there's no uh, ring fence fund in CP6 in terms of the, uh, the, the Scottish uh, strategic rail freight is the only fund we have for th that purpose, but new stations are scheduled for delivery during CP6, including Rob Royston, Dalcross, Kintour, uh, Reston and East Linton, uh, ones which were mentioned by uh, Rachel Hamilton in her, her speech. Also, uh, in terms of improvements that are being planned, undertaken through the Department of Transport's Access for All scheme, are going to be happening at Annisland, Croy, Dumfries, Johnston, Port Glasgow and Uddingston as well. So there's a significant number of projects happening. Perhaps we have to improve the visibility of those, um, given Mr Ruskell's comments, but I'm sure Mr Matheson will be keen to engage with the specific projects he mentioned. Um, if I can, in terms of just moving on to CP6 more generally, 
the change, there have been significant changes in the funding mechanisms, change in approach and change in project management. Uh, we're not build, only building on the significant investment of CP5 and progressing identified programmes in the next uh, five years, which aim to support longer term capacity needs. Uh, we're also taking industry with us, we hope, as we implement the new pipeline based approach to real project development and delivery. And central to this is uh, what is intended to be an integrated cross organisational partnership approach in doing so. I want to respond to some of the points that have been raised by members. I think a number of uh, interesting remarks around Leavenmouth. Um, uh, clearly, uh, there's still work to progress, but I recognise the strong interest from members in Fife and indeed Mr Ruskell as well, uh, covering the region. Transport Scotland is progressing transport appraisal work for the study in line with STAG um, and in close collaboration with Fife Council. The study is therefore separate from the Local Rail Development Fund. Uh, transport appraisal work will determine if there is a rationale for progressing the Leaving My Thrill link. I've heard very much today the importance of that to communities and indeed uh, take on board the point that was made uh, by Jenny Gilruth about the size of the community that potentially served. I should declare an interest uh, not on in my residence. My sister lives in that area, so uh, presiding officer, but as I'm not involved in the decision. Hopefully that will uh, not be a, a relevant factor. But Transport Sc Scotland officials and five council officers meet on a monthly basis with Peter Brett Associates, the consultant providing support to Transport Scotland on the study to discuss study progress so I want to reassure members who've raised that that um, work is ongoing on leave and mouth um, in terms of rest in east linton which uh, rachel hamilton raised the commitment uh, made by scottish minister to delivery of both rest in east linton stations as early as practical when within the control period six is unwavering so i want to reassure her of that um, detailed design and timetable analysis is ongoing and until both of these are completed, no firm uh, date for construction or opening can be given. But the, as she may know, the East Coast capacity study is due to be published soon, which will inform the construction window that could be used for development of the stations. On borderlands, which is a point that was raised again uh, by, by uh, uh, Rachel Hamilton, Transport Scotland are working with the team progressing the borderlands growth deal. Uh, regarding how the work undertaken to date feeds into the transport asks, which include a feasibility study into potential extension of the Borders Railway. And on discussions are ongoing regarding the wording around further transport appraisal work in the heads of terms agreement. And Transport Scotland are clear, though, uh, that they'll continue to work with the Borderlands Growth Deal uh, to investigate how the transport ask can be addressed. Um, Jamie Green mentioned the uh, Williams uh, Rail Review, very important uh, piece of work that's being undertaken, and Transport Scotland are very closely engaged in the Williams Review, and we press for full devolution of network rail uh, and full accountability, and we accept that accountability comes to the ministers. We will be held accountable for those decisions going forward, but we're willing to take that, uh, that risk, if you like, political risk, because we believe it will significantly help our ability to have a more coordinated approach to rail investment in Scotland. Um, Gillian Martin raised the point around Ellen and Aberdeenshire, uh, indeed, and uh, touched on issues that Mark McDonald also raised in regards to Newmacker and the Fort Martin to Buchan route. Um, STPR2 will focus on national and regional issues to deliver national uh, priorities with a clear alignment with climate change, uh, climate change plan. Regional transport working groups are being established in the hope uh, that we can keep members informed of that work and indeed engage with them. And Ross Greer uh, mentioned the Milgai uh, Western, and I tried to intervene, but just to address the point, um, Mr. Matheson actually meeting with East Dumbartonshire Council today to discuss this very scheme, so that's why he's not here in person. Uh, but uh, Milgai is now delivering uh, consistently high uh, right time uh, figures in terms of right time departure figures. I appreciate the points he made about the backlog, perhaps pre previous problems that have arisen on that route, but I hope that he's beginning to see the improvements that have arisen from the extension of the platform that you referenced. And uh, indeed, uh, to add also that um, there are more lines now in Scotland which are single with four trains per hour, and that includes routes in Lark Hall, Tweed Bank, to name a few, uh, where that, that has worked effectively using single track lines. Um, in terms of a uh, wider speech, just to finish up, presenting officer, I'm conscious of time and people need to get away. Um, if you wish a little more time to answer any questions, I'm not asking you to do it, I'll give you it, but thank, if you've got to be fine. That, that's great. Uh, I certainly recognise points being raised by members around uh, the kind of common sense points, if you like, looking at whether new opportunities such as the Aberdeen Exhibition Conference Centre, uh, the new marker point is made by Gillian Martin. These are obviously decisions to be taken by Mr. my colleague, Mr. Matheson. Uh, but one of the things I want to assure members today, all the points being raised in the debate, we will, we will study and take away uh, that have been raised in terms of potential projects and make sure that uh, colleagues in Scottish Government and Transport Scotland will look at those uh, as best possible. Recognise that Mr. Smith has raised East Riggs and other local campaigns and Emma Harper indeed talking very, uh, very much about the uh, east-west connections in Dumfries and Galloway and the benefits that rail could bring uh, to southwest Scotland. So 
I want to put on record, we, we certainly recognise the aspirations of communities in all of these areas and uh, we'll be keen to try and take forward projects through the Strategic Transport Project Review where we can do so. Um, the Local Rail Development Fund, which is the subject of discussion today, is currently funding 10 transport appraisals from uh, Haddington to Newborough and, and uh, indeed from Clydesdale uh, to St Andrews and there are from Local Rail Development Fund and this new £2 million fund enables local communities to appraise and potentially bring forward proposals aimed at tackling local rail connectivity issues. We do recognise that transport appraisal costs can be very significant for local stakeholders and communities and the fund responds directly to this. Uh, by providing an opportunity to apply for assistance with the appraisal costs and it is really pleasing to note uh, the progress is being made by, the, by those successful organisations across Scotland so it's a great opportunity we've as we worked with the Green Party in delivering that fund uh, I'm pleased to see it's beginning to have the effect that was sought from it but given the significant interest in the first phase of the fund it was relaunched at the end of February with the remaining balance of up to 1.3 million pounds and there is still time for local stakeholders and community groups uh, perhaps some of the organisations that were mentioned today uh, to apply as applications are welcome until the 28th of June. Uh, so I just want to put that on record. And we look forward to seeing the outputs of these transport appraisals as they will help to inform our future rail investment choices and importantly ensure we do not lose sight of the transport issues that affect our local communities across Scotland. And on that, uh, I'll leave it. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.